Alright guys, we're back to reading My Side of the Mountain. This is part two. We're starting where it says, in which I get started on this venture. This is on page nine. I left, my new, I left New York in May. I had a pen knife, a ball of cord, an axe, and $40, which I had saved from selling magazine subscriptions. I also had some flint and steel, which I had bought at a Chinese store in the city. The man in the store had showed me how to use it. He had also given me a little purse to put it in and some tinder to catch the sparks. He had told me if I ran out of tinder, I should burn cloth and use the shard ashes. I thanked him and said, this is the kind of thing I am not going to forget. On the train north to Catskills, I wrap my flint and steel and practice hitting them together to make sparks. On the wrapping paper, I made these notes. A hard brisk strike is best. Remember to hold the steel in the left hand and the flint in the right and hit the steel with the flint. The trouble is the sparks go every which way. And that was the trouble. I did not get the fire going that night. And as I mentioned, this was a scary experience. I hitched rides into Catskill Mountains. At about four o'clock, a truck driver and I passed through a beautiful dark hemlock forest. And I said to him, this is as far as I am going. He looked all around and said, you live here? No, I said, but I'm running away from home and this is just the kind of forest I have always dreamed to, dreamed I would run to. I think I'll camp here tonight. I hopped out of the cab. Hey boy, the driver shouted. Are you serious? Sure, I said. Well, now ain't that something, you know? When I was your age, I did the same thing. Only thing was, I was a farm boy, and I ran to the city, and you're a city boy running to the woods. I was scared of the city. Do you think you'll be scared of the woods? Heck no, I shouted loudly. As I marched into the cool, shadowy woods, I heard the driver call to me. I'll be back in the morning if you want to ride home. He laughed. Everybody laughed at me, even Dad. I told Dad that I was going to run away to Great Grandfather Gribbley's land. He had roared with laughter and told me about that time he had ran away from home. He got on a boat, headed for Singapore, but when the whistle blew for departure, he was, he was down the gangplank and home in bed before anyone knew he was gone. Then he told me, sure, go try it. Everybody should try it. I must have walked a mile into the woods until I found a stream. It was a clear, athletic stream that rushed and ran and jumped and splashed. Ferns grew along its bank, and its rocks were upholstered with moss. I sat down, smelled the piney air, and took out my penknife. I cut off a green twig and began to whittle. I have always been good at whittling. I carved a ship once that my teacher exhibited for parent night at school. First, I whittled an angle on one end of the twig. Then I cut a smaller twig and sharpened it to, to a point. I whittled an angle on that twig and bound the two angles face to face with a strip of dark, with a strip of green bark. It was supposed to be a fish hook. According to a book, How to Survive on the Land, that I read in the New York Public Library, this was the way to make your own hooks. I then dug for worms. I had hardly chopped the moss away with my axe before I hit frost. I had, it had not occurred to me that there would be frost in the ground in May, but then I had not been on the mountain before. This did worry me because I was deep depending on fish to keep me alive until I got to my great grandfather's mountain where I was going to make traps and catch game. Catch game. I looked into the stream to see what else I could eat, and as I did, my hand knocked a rotten log apart. I remembered about old logs and all the sleeping stages of insects that are in it. I chopped away until I found an, a cold white grub. I swiftly tried to string it to my hook and put the grub on and walked up the stream looking for a good place to fish. All of the manuals I have read were very empathetic about where fish lived, and and so I had memorized this. In streams, fish usually congregate in pools and deep, calm water. The heads of riffles, small rapids, the tails of pools, 
eddies below rocks or logs, deep undercut banks, and the shade of overhanging bushes, all are very likely paces to fish. This stream did not have any calm water, and I must have walked a thousand miles before I found a pool by a deep undercut bank and the shade of overhanging bushes. Usually it wasn't that far. It just seemed that way because I went looking and finding nothing. I was sure I was going to starve to death. I squatted on the bank and dropped in my line. I did so want to catch a fish. One fish would set me upon my way because I had read how much you can learn from one fish. By examining the contents of its stomach, you can find what other fish are eating or you can use the internal organs as bait. The grub went down to the bottom of the stream. It swirled around and hung still. Suddenly, the stream came to life and rode back and forth and around in a circle. I pulled a powerful jerk. The hook came apart and whatever I had went circling back to its bed. Well, that almost made me cry. My bait was gone, my hook was broken, and I was getting cold, frightened, and mad. I whittled another hook, but this same time I cheated and I used string to wind it together instead of bark. I walked back to the log and quickly found another grub. I hurried to the pool and flipped a trout out of the water before I knew I had a bite. The fish flopped and I threw my whole body over it. I could not bear to think of it flopping itself back into the stream. I cleaned it like I had seen the man in the fish market do, examining its stomach and found it empty. This horrified me. What I didn't know was that an empty stomach means fish are hungry and will eat about anything. However, I thought at that time that I was a goner. Sadly, I put some of the internal organs on my hook and before I could get my line to the bottom, I had another bite. I lost that one, but got the next one. I stopped when I had five nice trout and looked around for a place to build a camp and make a fire. It wasn't hard to find a pretty spot along the stream. I selected a place beside a mossy rock in a circle of hemlocks. I decided to make a bed before I cooked. I cut off some bros for a mattress. Then I leaned some dead limbs against the boulder and covered them with hemlock limbs. This made a kind of tent. I crawled in, laid down, and felt alone and secret and very excited. But, ah, the rest of this story. I was on the northeast side of the mountain. It grew dark and cold early. Seeing the shadows slide down on me, I frantically ran around gathering firewood. This is about the only thing I did right from the moment until dawn because I remembered the driest wood in the forest is the dead limbs that are still on the trees, and I gathered an enormous pile of them. That pile must still be there, for I never forgot, for before I never got that fire going. I got sparks, sparks, sparks. I even hit the tender with the sparks. The tender burned all night, but it was as far as I got. I blew on it, I breathed on it, I cupped it in my hands, but no sinner, sooner did I get the twig the twigs, then the whole thing went black. Then it got too dark to see. I clicked steel and flint together, even though I couldn't see the tender. Finally, I gave up and crawled back into my hemlock tent, hungry, cold, and miserable. I can talk about the first night now, although it was still embarrassing to me because I was so stupid and scared and I hate to admit it. I had made my hemlock bed right in the stream valley where the wind drained down from the cold mountaintop. It might have been all right if I had made it on the other side of the boulder, but I didn't. I was right on the main highway of the cold winds as they tore down upon the valley below. I didn't have enough hemlock bows under me, and before I had my head down, my stomach was cold and damp. I took some bows off the roof and stuffed them up under me, and then my shoulders were cold. I curled up in a ball and was almost asleep when a whirl, whirlpool will called. If you have ever been within 40 feet of a whirlpool will, you will understand why I couldn't even shut my eyes. They are deafening. Well, anyways, the whole night went like that. I didn't think I slept 15 minutes and I was so scared and tired that my throat was dry. I wanted a drink but didn't dare go near the stream for fear of making a misstep and falling in and getting wet, so I sat tight. 
and shivered and shook, and now I am able to say I cried a little tiny bit. Fortunately, the sun has a wonderfully glorious habit of rising every morning, and the sky lightened when the birds awoke. I knew I would never see anything so splendid as the round red sun coming up over the earth. I was immediately cheered and set out directly for the highway. Somehow I thought that if I was a little near the road, everything would be all right. I climbed a hill and stopped. There was a house, a house warm and cozy with smoke coming out the chimney and lights in the windows and only a hundred feet from my torture camp. Without considering my pride, my pride, I ran down the hill and banged on the door. A nice old man answered. I told him everything in one long sentence. And then he said, and so, and then I said, and so can I cook my fish here? Because I haven't eaten in years. He chuckled, stroked his whiskery face and took the fish. He had them cooking in a pan before, before I knew what his name was. When I asked him, he said, Bill something. But I never heard his last name because I fell asleep in his rocking chair that was pulled up beside his big, hot, glorious wood stove in the kitchen. I ate the fish some hours later, also some bread, jelly, oatmeal, and cream. Then he said to me, Sam Gribbley, if you're going to run and live off in the woods, you better learn how to make a fire. Come with me. We spent the afternoon practicing. I penciled these notes on the back of scratch paper so I wouldn't forget. When the tender glows, keep blowing and add fine dry needles one by one and keep blowing steadily, lightly, and evenly. Add one, dry, one inch dry twigs to the needles and then give her a big old handful of small dry stuff. Keep blowing. Next chapter. The manner in which I find Gribbley's farm. The next day I told Billy goodbye. As I strode, warm and fed, onto the road he called to me. I'll see you tonight. The back door is open if you want a roof over your head. I said, okay. But I knew I wouldn't see Billy, Bill again. I knew how to make fire, and that was my weapon. With fire, I could conquer the cat skills. I also knew how to fish. To fish and to make fire. That was all I needed to know, I thought. Three rides that morning took me to Delhi. Some were around here. What, some around here was Grandfather's Beech Tree with the name Gribbley carved on it. This much I knew from Dad's stories. By six o'clock, I had not found anyone who had even heard of the Gribbleys, much less Gribbley's Beach. And so I slept on the porch of a schoolhouse and ate chocolate bars for supper. It was cold and hard, but I was so tired, I could have slept in a wind tunnel. At dawn, I thought real hard. Where would I find out about the Gribbley farm? Some old map, I said. Well, where would I find an old map? The library? Maybe. I'd try it and see. The librarian was very helpful. She was sort of young, had brown hair and brown eyes, and loved books as much as I did. The library didn't open until 10.30. I got there at 9. After I had lolled and rolled and sat on the steps for about 15 or 20 minutes, the door whisked open. The tall lady asked me to come in and browse around until opening time. All I said to her was that I wanted to find the old Gribbley farm and that the Gribbleys hadn't lived on it for maybe a hundred years, and she was off. I can still hear her heels click. When I think of her, scattering herself into those shelves, finding the old maps, histories of the Catskills, and files of letters and deeds that must have came from attics around Delhi, Miss Turner, that was her name, found it. She found Gribbley's farm in an old book of Delaware County. Then she worked out the roads to it and drew me maps of everything. Finally, she said, what do you want it for, some school project? Oh no, Miss Turner, I want to live there. But Sam, it is all forest and trees now. The house is probably only a foundation covered with moss. That's just what I want. I'm going to trap animals and eat nuts and bulbs and berries and make myself a house, you see. I am Sam Gribbley, and I thought I would like to live with my great grandparents' farm. Miss Turner was the only person that believed me. She smiled, sat back in her chair, and said, Well, I declare. The library was just opening when I gathered the notes we had made and started off. As I pushed open the door, Miss Tanner leaned over and said to me, Sam, we have some very good books on plants and trees and animals in case you get stuck. 
I knew what she was thinking, and so I told her I would remember that. With Miss Turner's map, I found the first stone wall that marked the farm. The old roads to it were all grown up and mostly gone. But by locating the stream at the bottom of the mountain, I was able to begin at the bridge and go north up from the mile and a half. There, caterpillaring around boulders, roller coastering up, ravines and down hills was a mound of rocks that had once been great great grandfather's boundary fence and then do you know i could believe i was there i sat on the old gray stones a long time looking through the forest up that steep mountain and saying to myself it must be sunday afternoon and it's raining and dad is trying to keep us all quiet telling us about great grandfather's farm and he's telling us it would be real and i could and be so real that I could see it. And then I said, no, I am here because I was never this hungry before. I wanted to run all the way back to the library and tell Miss Turner that I found it. Partly because she would have liked to have known, and partly because Dad said to me as I left, if you found that place, tell someone in Delhi. I may visit you someday. Of course he was kidding because he thought I'd be home the next day. But after many weeks, maybe he would think, I meant, that I meant what I said, and he might come see me. However, I was too hungry to run back. I took my hook and line and went back down the mountain to the stream. I caught a big old catfish. I climbed back to the stone wall in great spirits. It was getting late, and so I didn't try to explore. I went right to work, making a fire. I decided that even if I didn't have enough dime, time to cut bows for a bed, I was going to have to have cooked fish in a fire to huddle around during these cold night hours. May is not exactly warm in Catskills. By firelight that night I wrote this, Dear Bill, that was the old man. After three tries, I finally got a handful of dry grass on the glow in the tender. Grass is even better than pine needles, and tomorrow I'm going to try the outside bark of the river birch. I read somewhere that it has combustible oil, that the Indians used to start fires. Anyway, I did just what you showed me and had cooked catfish for dinner. It was good. Your friend, Sam. After I wrote that, I remembered I didn't know his last name. And so I stuffed the note in my pocket, made myself a bed of bows and leaves in the shelter of the stone wall and fell right to sleep. I must say this now about the first fire. It was magic. Out of the dead tender, the grass and sticks came alive, warm light. It cracked and snapped and smoked and filled the woods with brightness. It, light, it lightened the trees and made them warm and friendly. It stood tall and bright and held back the night. Oh, this was a different night than the first dark, frightful one. I also was stuffed on catfish. I have once learned to cook it more, but never have I enjoyed a meal as much as that one, and never have I felt so independent again.